Here we go. Um, this one. Okay. So guys, what was the take-home message from our first few minutes together? When is the AP test? Tomorrow. Next time. Guys, seriously, you're, you'll see. We're going to get together and you're going to be like, you weren't kidding. So, guys, we started here and we started with phase diagrams. So you should have something that resembles this in your notes. Guys, take a second and just re-familiarize yourselves with this. Um, get a sense of where is temperature, where is pressure, what do the lines represent, what do the dots represent, except for letter D. That's letters C and D are just, well, I guess they could represent something, but it's what the whole line represents. Um, guys, and then we'll do a quick review. And then we are going to look at the phase diagrams of two interesting compounds, and we're going to talk about some of the things that make them uh, interesting. So, give you a second to refresh. Two and a half weeks have never gone faster. Say that again? Oh no, the next minute it's the AP test. And then, right. And, yeah, and then three days later, my daughter leaves to be a summer camp counselor, and basically I'll never see her again. It's very sad. Yeah, isn't that crazy? All right, guys, so let's do this. So these are the things that you've got to be able to do with phase diagrams. And guys, we sort of organized it this way last time, but let's be sure. You need to be able to use these um, predictively as it relates to change, but you've also got to be able to use these informationally just in terms of knowing the bits and the parts. So guys, if, if you have your diagrams in front of you, we've got to remember that zero is at the origin of both of these axes. So this on the y-axis represents a vacuum, and on the x-axis this represents absolute zero. And so guys, the way that I like to think about this is relative to temperature because I get cold warmer and hot so when we're cold we're a solid when we're warmer we're a liquid and when we're hot we're a gas and that makes sense to me because we don't deal a lot in our day-to-day -day lives with pressure changes so I just like to do it like that I think guys remember uh, these lines represent the phase boundaries what's this phase boundary right here Deposition and sublimation. This one is melting and freezing. And then, of course, this one is vaporization and condensation. Um, then, guys, we've got this interesting point down here called the triple point, where the solid, liquid, and gas phases all exist in equilibrium. So it's freezing, melting, depositing, sublimating, boiling, and condensing all at the same time. And then, guys, remember we tied that back to thermo. And remember we said that if all of those things are happening at the same time, is this reversible? Oh, by the way, guys, that's the other thing I forgot to mention. During the rest of the year, we're going to be sprinkling in AP review a lot. So get used to it. So, guys, don't disengage and go, oh, wait, that was, I'll get to that later. Guys, these are the things you need to be bringing forward from previous units. So, guys, at the triple point, is this process reversible? No, yeah, it's at equilibrium. And guys, remember the idea. Something that is, ir that is reversible, remember the idea that if something is irreversible, it means it goes one way and not the other. Is that... Okay, so we'll talk more. But with that said, guys, at the triple point, we are at equilibrium, which means it's doing all six of those things simultaneously. And so that's a condition of equilibrium. You guys good? All right. So then this. I wish there was a... Well, maybe I can show these to you one at a time. Um, so, guys, let's look left first. And I'm just going to super zoom into this. Guys, this... Is this is the uh, phase diagram for water. 
And gang, you've got to, and I know that this is hard because you're not looking at it in, in contrast to other phase diagrams. But guys, what I want to do is I want to step you through some ideas, and then we need to talk about what makes this interesting and unique. So guys, first of all, the uh, triple point of water is only slightly above zero, the freezing point of water. But guys, the triple point of water is at a very, very low pressure. So if we look at one atmosphere of pressure, this explains why water goes solid, melts, becomes liquid, and then boils. And so guys, you've got to be able to do that predictively. They would say something like, at one atmosphere of pressure, what happens if you increase the temperature? And you've got to be able to track those changes. But then they could also say something like this, at two torr pressure, what happens is you add energy to ice. And guys, at two torrs of pressure, water cannot be in its liquid state, and so it goes from solid straight to vapor, um, and we call that sublimation. Do you understand those ideas? Okay, then this is the thing that makes this really crazy. So, guys, imagine that we have an ice cube at zero degrees Celsius, and, well, actually, let's do this. So let's go ice cube at zero degrees Celsius, and if we squeeze that ice cube, what's eventually going to happen? It's going to melt. And B, actually, I'm going to pick on that for just a second. All of this is water. I know that in our mind we think water is a liquid, but did you guys catch that? That it's not enough to say it turns into water. I know that we experience water often as a liquid, but we need to say it turns into a liquid. So guys, ice, when you squeeze it, will eventually melt. So guys, we talked about this. What other substances on Earth do this? If you take the solid and you squeeze it, it melts. What are the other ones that do that? There aren't any. Guys, water is the only, well, there are actually two really exotic crystals that they've been able to create um, that we don't dig up that do this as well. But guys, really, for all intents and purposes, nothing else does. So guys, here's the trick. Now let's bring in carbon dioxide. They will do this to you on the test. Guys, the one on the right, and they will have no labels. They will give you, well actually, they'll give you the one on the left. And they, they'll do this in multiple choice. They'll give you the phase diagram for a substance and they'll say, what substance could this possibly be? And guys, you need to notice the difference between the phase diagram of water and the phase diagram of carbon dioxide and every other substance on the planet. What's the fundamental difference? Of what? Yeah, you're doing this. Yeah. Guys, this phase boundary, water is the only substance on Earth that has a phase boundary between solid and liquid that has a negative slope. That's worth writing down. Guys, water is the only substance on Earth that has a negative phase boundary, or I'm sorry, has a phase boundary between solid and liquid that has a negative slope. So there is definitely the possibility that they could do something like this and throw that phase diagram on a test and they could ask you things like, is this water? And guys, again, water is the only one with a negative uh, uh, slope to the phase boundary between the solid and the liquid. Other things that they will do to you on the test is they could give you something like the one on the right and they could give you a list of substances, and they could say something like, if you were looking at the one on the right, they would say, could this be water? Could this be uh, CH4? Or could this be CO2? And obviously, we know the answer is that it's, that. well, it could be. Uh, CH4 is a bad example. Uh, let's do this. Could it be NaCl? They could give you something like this, and they, could, they would ask you, which one of these could this possibly be? So guys, let's work this backwards. So we, we know that it's carbon dioxide, but how would we know if we didn't know? So how can we rule out water? 
it's got a positive slope to the phase boundary. Guys, how do we know that it's not NaCl? Go ahead. NaCl doesn't exist. Oh no! Oh, anything can be vaporized. Yeah. So the boy. Oh, no, yeah, okay, so let's talk about that. So when, when we have salt water, right, when we heat up the salt water, the water goes away and the salt stays behind. <clears throat> That's simply because with the Bunsen burner, just a second, with a Bunsen burner, we can create temperatures that are hot enough to turn water into a vapor, but we can create temperatures that are hot enough to turn table salt into a vapor. There are no substances, even diamond can be vaporized if you get it hot enough. So it's not that. Go ahead, Elijah. Um, Rob, would, would temperatures be like a sign that, it, that it's either, that, it, that it's probably not like CO2? Because, it's because normally salts would have very high um, melt <coughs> would because, norm, because normal salts would have, normally salts would have a high boiling point like that of salt. Okay. And most gases tend to to only solidify or turn to that low, low temperature. There you go. Closer. But, Taylor, follow up on that. Um, we know CO2 gas. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's talk. So what maybe might the phase diagram of salt look like? So we most, we're most familiar with NaCl being a solid, right? And so if we look at our conditions, we are down here. So our conditions are one atmosphere, right? Um, and then also, our, let's say our room temperature is around 22 degrees Celsius, which lies somewhere in here. So this at... Our, our standard conditions is a gas. And we know that salt at standard conditions is not a gas, it's a solid. So they probably wouldn't have you then draw the phase diagram for table salt, but they guys, they could totally do this to you. And it might even be in free response where they would say something like this phase diagram could be the phase diagram for water, table salt, or carbon dioxide. Which one is it? And explain why the other ones it can't be. Weird sentence, but you know what I'm saying. And so we could exclude water because of the positive slope of that phase boundary. And then simply by finding standard conditions, whatever this substance is, is a gas. And that is not salt at standard conditions. So yeah. Do we have the 1 ATM as standard conditions for pressure? Is there a fixed temperature? Yeah, here, <laughs> this, yes. So we didn't get to do gases last year, right? Yeah, so we're going to talk about what is called STP, standard temperature and pressure. And you're going to find out that it's the pressure and temperature on an average day at sea level. Um, and so, yeah, so standard pressure is one atmosphere of pressure. Um, <clears throat> given the, with, sometimes standard temperature is 20 Celsius, sometimes it's 25 Celsius, um, depending on the context. Let's, well, we'll look at the AP cheat sheet later, and it defines it. So, yeah, there's definitely a standard temperature. Absolutely. Oh, yes, absolutely. Go ahead, Ivan. Exactly, precisely. But then, guys, you're also going to see this. They would do something like this. If you take this substance and uh, at one atmosphere, and if you heat it up, they'll ask you questions about... Um, what does it do as it gets warmer, that sort of stuff. Sometimes they'll even talk you through the whole process and they'll say what happens here, what happens here, and then what happens here. And so guys, we'll talk about this briefly, but we're going to get more into it in a minute. But you should remember this from the lab that you did last. Do you remember that lab we did last year where we uh, froze wax? Oh boy. Froze wax and, and and boiled water. You guys remember that? And we learned this. The guys, if we add energy to a substance and if we track its temperature, what are we going to be down here at low energy, low temperature? Solid? 
right? This is not a phase diagram. So guys, we are down at low energy, low temperature, and that would be a solid. Then as we add energy, the temperature goes up, right? You're heating something up until it starts to melt. And then the temperature doesn't change anymore. Where does the energy go if it's not changing the temperature? Do you remember? Phase change, it's breaking the crystalline structure of the ice. Then once it's all melted, we continue to add more energy and then the water molecules move faster and faster. And then when it boils, it stops. Where's that energy going? Break good, breaking the IMFs, and then we heat up the, the gas. Well, guys, that's sort of, just a moment. <clears throat> guys, that's what we're looking at here, if you can make the connection. So the idea is that when we're right here, we're adding energy. And we know that because the temperature is going up. So we're adding energy, and here the molecules are moving faster. This is the point at which it sublimates. And guys, that's crazy, because in order for something to sublimate, what has to fail? Isn't that the problem? No, no. no, sublimating is that direction. So guys, as we're going from solid to gas, what, where's the energy going as this thing sublimates? What's it going to change in the substance? Breaking IMFs and breaking the crystal structure. So guys, it's almost like melting and boiling all at the same time because we're taking ice and we're breaking the crystal structure. Normally that would make a liquid, and again this is carbon dioxide. We're breaking down the crystal structure, but we're also breaking the IMFs. So it's literally like melting and boiling at the same time. Then we've got carbon dioxide gas, and as we continue to heat it, the molecules just move faster. You guys good on that stuff? Okay. So, guys, really, this is kind of cool. So, I don't know if you know this. I've never taught this material like this before. We've always done phase diagrams last. I'm never going to do that again. I like this a whole lot more, doing phase diagrams first. So, let's do this. Let's go back here. Um, so, guys, questions on phase diagrams? Things you want to talk about? Is this sitting okay? We're all right, yeah? Is there anything that, like, if you add enough energy to make it into a gas and you spray the monsters, so it could exist as gas? Oh, oh. <coughs> so you're, like, saying if you took... I won't hit you. You need light. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, like, would it be possible to take liquid water and break this into hydrogen and oxygen rather than having it boil? Like if there's substance that like, didn't have very strong bonds, so instead of ever boiling, it would have very strong bonds. Yeah, yeah, and so let me, let me offer a thought that isn't really the answer to your question, but then we can talk about your question. So we understand that when water boils, right, the IMFs break and this goes away, there's actually a way to get, to add energy to water and it doesn't boil, it breaks apart. Did that, do you, so, so what is that? And the answer is electricity. So if you pass electricity through water, it will not boil. It will actually decompose. Um, still, the bonds are stronger than the intermolecular forces, but the electrons are, the, the current is a flow of electrons, and these electrons flowing through the water actually disrupt the bonds rather than the intermolecular forces, and it turns it into hydrogen and oxygen. We're going to look more at that in a couple days. Um, so it is definitely possible. It depends on the type of energy. Um, but relative to heat, when we're adding heat, it's always the weakest link that breaks first, and so typically it's the IMFs first, and not the bonds first. So guys, other thoughts or questions? You guys all good? All right. So I would encourage, oh, please. Um, this is going back a little bit yeah? to the triple point. Yeah. Um, I'm really confused. So it's in equilibrium. Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> and that was the place that I, so I'll be, frankly, as I started to bring in thermo into this conversation, I could see some of your eyes start to glaze over, and I was like, 
uh, we just got back after a two and a half week break. Maybe now is not the time to dig into this. But no, I, I, you, could, you probably felt me sort of walk away from it. Um, but no, the answer is yes. So this is at equilibrium, which means that it is, without even talking about reversibility, the, the real trick is spontaneity. And so that we would say is not spontaneous because something that is spontaneous has a direction that always goes and it has a direction that it never goes on its own. That links back to reversibility. But we would not call it spontaneous. We would call it equilibrium, which, and again, I don't want to dig too deep, which really means it's spontaneous in both directions, right? Because it's doing both, but we don't call that dual spontaneity. We call it reversible. Um, and so, ah, well, yeah, I didn't want to dig too deep, but what you said is correct. All right, guys, anything else about phase diagrams? Y'all good? Okay. So, guys, do not write any of this down, but let me just see if I can get an amen. Guys, are we all familiar? Are we all comfortable with the idea that gases do these things? They take on the, this was your notes from general chemistry. We called this TOSVOC take on shape and volume of container. We know that gases are compressible. The molecules are all spread out, and when we squeeze them, they come closer together. Guys, they spread out rapidly, um, and they also flow. Gases flow. Um, and so we understand that gases are, they're all spread out, they fill their volumes, they fill their shapes, and they flow and spread out readily. That's okay, right? Then, guys, liquids do take on the shape of their container, but not the volume of the container. If we could say that this is liquid water, the idea is it takes on the shape of the container, but it doesn't completely fill it because they're held together as a liquid, unlike a gas, which fills the entire space. Then, guys, they um, are virtually incompressible, which I know seems weird, but, guys, if you squeeze on a liquid, it does not change. Uh, it doesn't compress a lot. That's how hydraulics work. Do you guys understand the idea? That like if you have a, a front end loader, do you guys know how these work? You've got pistons. Maybe you've seen them. There's a large cylinder and then an inner uh, cylinder, which is the only typically clean part on the machinery because it slides in and out of the cylinder. And literally, guys, there are there are pumps. They use oil, and they pump on the oil, and instead of the oil compressing, the oil pushes, and it makes the dump thing go up and, yeah, okay. All right, and then guys, um, these don't spread out very readily. Um, it will evaporate, it diffuses, not quickly, um, but it will evaporate, it's just a lot slower. And then guys, and obviously liquids flow. And then guys, finally solids, these are the things that are true. They don't take on the shape or the volume of their container. You squeeze them and they don't change much at all. Um, they don't diffuse very well. Although guys, have any of you seen these videos on YouTube? where they actually take two dissimilar metals and they put them together and then under an electron microscope they crush them and you can actually see the metals dissolve into each other. It's really cool. You should look it up. If we have time, we will. Um, and then guys, not surprisingly, metals don't, or uh, solids don't flow. Um, all the, well, we'll talk in a minute because what's that? Kind of. Um, I, I don't know enough metallurgy to say for sure. I know that amalgamation is that blending together, but I don't know if pressure forced uh, um, doing that counts as amalgamation. It might, but I'm not sure. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Yes, it's sublimation. Yeah, well, and like just by itself, like not uh, even if it doesn't meet the like proper, uh, proper like temperature or pressure. Yeah, points. yeah. So let me give you an example. Um, so. Um, fascinating field of study, snow science. Um, Utah is one of the 
the centers for snow physics in the entire world. And, um, and you've probably experienced this. If, if, guys, if you've ever been out snowshoeing, hiking in the snow, whatever, and they, they call it surface whore. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's when the snow on the surface gets really, really crystalline and sugary. Yeah, what's actually happening is that the snow is sublimating. Um, we're nowhere near the temperature pressure conditions where snow will sublimate, but it's sublimating in the same way that evaporating is like really slow boiling. Um, snow does that, and especially up like up high where there's a lot of radiant energy from the sun and the air is really dry and it's windy and what you'll actually see is that the snow is sublimating really really slow but it's sublimating and that's what creates surface hoar and so yeah you can have solids that that do that they're they're sublimating really slowly and so it happens with snow all the time all is a tough word in here, right? Um, <laughs> I, I don't even know if I could say, yeah, I don't even know if I would go with most. I'm just excited I know one example, um, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah, but it's, it's fascinating science. It's really cool. So, guys, are we good on all these ideas? Is that all right? So, does this then feel and look familiar? It's really, I don't know, I'm sure you don't remember, but last year you actually filled out a notes page that looked like this. And so, guys, as we're looking at this, the idea is that the highest energy state is the gaseous state. There's way too many molecules in there. There should be like one or two in the entire box. Guys, and I'll show you in a minute. Gases are very, very diffuse. Um, again, total disorder takes on the space, all of that stuff. Then we've got condensing and we've got boiling, the liquid state. And guys, just as our mental picture, what do we think of when we think liquid? Mosh pit. Mosh pit. It is anarchy in there, guys. Stuff slamming into each other. Then when we freeze, we come into this crystalline solid state like ice. They don't take on the shape or volume of their containers. They're just way settled down, crystalline structure. Remember, this does have intermolecular forces. What it doesn't have is crystalline structure. Is that okay? You good on that? All right. So guys, what I want to do then is I want to show this to you. Um, I think I explained this to you last year, but I'm sure you don't remember. Um, guys, there's a, there's a, a, a doctor, a, a, chem, a, a PhD in chemistry over in Australia. His name's Roy Tasker. Um, and he has actually made it his life's mission to keep high school students from learning stupid stuff in high school chemistry. He's really, like, it, it, I got to go to a, con did I tell you about this? I got to go to a conference with him, and the first thing that he wrote on the board was N-A-C-L-A-Q. Did I tell you about this? We, I don't remember. And he said, how many of you, is high, and this was all high school chem teachers, AP teachers. He's like, how many of you have ever written that on the board in front of your students? And we're all like, yeah. And he's like, you understand that doesn't exist, right? Do we talk? I don't remember. Yeah. yeah, and the idea that it's actually sodium ion and chloride ion and salt doesn't exist in water. Anyway, that's the sort of stuff he does. And so then the next thing he did is he started showing us all these really weird animations. And guys, remember, animations are cartoons. He's like, here's all the cartoons that you show your kids about chemical reactions and phases of matter. And guys, it was super convicting. You were like, oh, shit. And he actually had us get together in groups and talk about why all of these things were wrong. And then he said, let me show you what this really looks like. And guys, he wrote a grant and he actually got some time on um, one of the web, I think it might have been Google's or IBM's computer, but he actually got some time on a supercomputer to do simulations of what the different phases of, of water look like. So guys, this is not an artist's rendition. This is not a cartoon. This is literally the math 
they wrote equations to model the behavior and structure in ice. They slowed it down by a couple powers of 10, because if it were real-time speed, you wouldn't be able to see anything. It's going so fast. But guys, this has actually slowed down what it looks like in a crystal of ice. There are literally hollow tubes moving throughout the structure. The water molecules are held together with intermolecular forces. You can see the crystalline structure and the molecules just sit there and vibrate. They have vibrational kinetic energy. And guys, that's literally what it looks like inside of a, of a chunk of ice. It's not an animation, it's a simulation. Was it kind of what you'd expect? So then this, guys, this is what it looks like when ice melts. So here we've got the ice, and you'll notice that as we increase temperature, what are you going to see happen to the water molecules? They're going to move faster. And as they move faster and faster and faster, they approach the melting point, at which point the intermolecular forces fail, and now we've got the mosh pit. And guys, this is literally what it looks like inside melting ice. So now we've got the mosh pit. And so guys, this is what it looks like, again, slower, slowed down by a couple of factors of 10, but guys, this is literally what it looks like inside of liquid water. Uh, are they still vibrating? They are. They still have vibrational energy, but most... and. That's the interesting bit, is that we've talked about the idea that temperature doesn't change when the ice melts, right? And so really what you're doing is you've got, you've got positional kinetic energy and you have vibrational kinetic energy. And so what happens is, is that when you're adding energy to ice, the temperature goes up. That's vibrational energy. Then what happens is, is as the structure fails, the additional energy that you're adding, most of it goes to positional kinetic energy rather than vibrational kinetic energy, but they still have vibrational energy. And guys, that then again, here's our, here's our liquid water. Oh, what's happening with those that are leaving? They're evaporating, but guys, notice they're also coming back. So, guys, let's talk about that. In liquid water, it's not surprising to us that water molecules evaporate. And, guys, typically when these water molecules evaporate, they just leave. But what happens if we put a lid on the container? We're going to talk more about that in a minute. All right, so now, guys, we've been through liquid water. Then, guys, um, this is what it looks like Oh, actually, you know what? I'm sorry. That went, this is actually boiling. I apologize. Again, slowed down. In the liquid water one, we didn't go to the surface. So this is actually not evaporation, although evaporation would just be slower. This is actually boiling. And then we're up in the gas phase and back and forth. And then, guys, this is what it looks like inside of steam. This is literally water vapor. It's that diffuse. Guys, there's that much space between these molecules. So this is what it looks like in water vapor. Does that all sit okay? Hey. 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 It can't be worse than we thought. I've thought pretty bad things. Third and fourth grade, third and fourth quarters are completely late. I'm putting a grade in third quarter today. Yeah. And it's showing grades for third and fourth. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Because we know that at Orem High and fourth quarter, we're just basically done anyway. True. So what they've actually done is they've acknowledged that, and they're just going to give all of our students the same grade fourth as third. Yeah, because otherwise our graduation rates will go down, and that's bad. Yeah, we don't. No. Because graduation rates are all the They are. And it shows learning. Especially fourth quarter. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. 
Yeah. Oh, good. I already sat down. Oh, good. <laughs> What's that? Apparently now. Um, so when we come back to third quarter, Skyward doesn't understand that there's year-long classes. Um, Skyward thinks all classes are in semesters. So you've got first and second quarter, third and fourth quarter. So when we come back to third quarter, teachers that teach year-long classes have to reset up Skyward. Um, and apparently now it's linked third and fourth quarters together. I'm just realizing all the snarky stuff that I just said got recorded. All right, so, so guys, this is where the rubber hits the road, and this is where you need to start taking notes. So you guys understand, I think, I hope, that, guys, this unit, um, and I know I keep saying this, but forgive me. Guys, this unit is the most challenging unit you'll see on the AP test. Let me explain to you now how this plays out. So guys, we are now at the point where we understand about intermolecular forces. We understand about induced dipoles, dipole-dipole forces. We understand about ion-dipole forces. We, we understand all these intermolecular forces. Now, we also understand, largely from review, about these ideas about phases. What do solids look like? What do liquids look like? What do gases look like? And what do the changes between them look like? Well, guys, now what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to end today, we are going to gather together the large-scale properties of these substances. We're going to talk about boiling. We're going to talk about viscosity. We're going to talk about volatility. Guys, some of this is review. Sorry. Some of this is review from last year. But guys, some of this is brand new. But we're going to fill up our vocabulary box with these ideas. And then, guys, for the rest of this unit, we're just going to talk about how shape and structure and polarity affect these things. So first of all, this might be worth drawing something similar. Not very big. Well, and frankly, it's up to you. But at least, if nothing else, you need to have a pretty solid mental picture of this image. And I'm realizing I need to order a new projector bulb. Have you noticed this has been getting dimmer over the year? We need to get a new one. So, and guys, obviously lots of circles, right? Do what you need to do. Don't get too carried away. But we need to define what we're looking at, and then we're going to talk about what is represented in this picture. So guys, let's not spend too much time drawing the circles. And we may as well talk about it right now. What we really care about are the red arrows. And what do the red arrows represent? Intermolecular forces. So guys, when we do this, we talk about the intermolecular forces that impact the substance, the, the molecules, the particles at the surface and then also the ones that impact the uh, particles in the middle. So you're ready to talk? You need to understand viscosity. You may re actually, no, we didn't do this last year. This is new. Guys, you need to understand the idea of viscosity. Do any of you just happen to know what it means? No? Did any of you change your own engine oil? Have any of you gone to Jiffy Lube and got your oil? Please say yes. Got, you've had your oil changed, right? And you see this little sticker up in the upper left-hand corner of your windshield, and the first thing you realize is it's been 20,000 miles since you had your oil changed, and you're like, oh, snap. 
Yeah, right? But then you see this little number, on, and don't write this down, but guys, you see this little number, and it says something like 5W30, and you have no stinking idea what that means. Or maybe you see something like 15W after that, and you have no idea what that means. Guys, that number is the viscosity rating of your oil. So let me explain viscosity to you. You ready? Water has a very low viscosity. Molasses has a very high viscosity. Do you now understand the idea? No, it's, it's not about a phase change. It's about a resistance to flow. No, like what is the point of the solid? Like if someone said it like doesn't flow, that Yeah, but don't, no, no. So don't, we're not going to take this into phase change. We're simply going to talk about how readily something flows. But then importantly, we're going to link it back to intermolecular forces. Okay. So, guys, we're not going to talk about the units, but let's make you more intelligent uh, car owners. So, when you see that your car needs um, 15W oil, guys, that 15 is actually the viscosity rating of your oil, and that's, that's sort of in the middle. It usually ranges from about 5 to 50. That's at the thinner end of the range. Um, but, guys, what on earth does does this mean? What does it mean to be 530 oil? And guys, the answer is this is magic stuff. They have actually figured out ways to make oil have different thicknesses at different times. So if your engine is revving really, really fast, the oil gets thicker to protect your engine. But then if your engine is moving slower, the oil gets thinner so it can flow through the engine effectively and still protect things. Yeah? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't want to get into non-Newtonian fluids because the but 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 you're absolutely right. These are fluids that when you jiggle them faster, they become thicker. Um, it is non-Newtonian, but I don't want to go there. But yeah, but no, you're absolutely right. But guys, maybe some of you have noticed this. You need different oil in the summer and the winter. Why? Would you want thicker or thinner oil in the winter? Thinner. Because it's colder and the molecules are moving slower, which makes the oil thicker. And so in the winter, many times you'll run thinner oil, and in the summer you'll run thicker oil, or uh, summer you'll run thicker oil, because in the heat, the oil gets thinner, and you still need the oil to be able to lubricate your car. Does all of that sort of jive? But guys, at the end of the day, viscosity is resistance to flow. One last thing. How do you measure viscosity? The answer is pretty cool. They actually have, you can buy these. They're called viscosity meters. It's actually a, a plastic tube that's about a meter tall, and it has a standardized ball that comes with it. And you fill up the tube with the liquid, and then you drop the ball in, and you time it. And the amount of time that it takes to go from the top to the bottom then has a conversion that converts to viscosity. Huh? Not bad. All right. So, guys, are you okay on viscosity? Is that jiving for you? Okay. So, um, what does this have to do with intermolecular forces? We should make the connection. Guys, if a substance has stronger intermolecular forces, will it have higher or lower viscosity? Higher viscosity. They're more, they're more tied together. And this may be, it's not really in the, is it in the notes? Uh, no, it's not. So we should include this. Guys, the idea is that the higher the IMFs, the higher the viscosity. But we may as well talk about this too. Guys, if that's true, shouldn't water have a really high viscosity? You know what I'm saying? So why doesn't it? 
And the answer is because the size of the molecules. Guys, this also relates to size. So the higher the size of the molecule, the higher the viscosity as well. Um, and that's why water is not very viscous. It has a really, really strong intermolecular force, but the molecules are so small that they just get out of the way really, really easily. That's it okay? Yeah. That's yes, yeah, size is actually that's why oil is so viscous. Um, or even molasses. The sugar molecules that make up molasses are huge, and that actually uh, makes it more viscous. Yeah, so size is your major predictor. You guys good there? All right. So guys, moving along, the next one that we need to know for sure, and there's one that we're really gonna have to pause on. So we're gonna sort of skip through these. Do you guys remember adhesive forces? Where do adhesive forces exist? Different substances. I like to remember the word adhesive, like glue. Glue sticks different things together. And so guys, adhesive forces are the forces that exist between substances that are different. But again, guys, the same connection is true. Inter so they're intermolecular forces that bind substances together. The higher the polarity, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the stronger the adhesive forces. Give you a second to ponder that one. So guys, adhesive forces. Where do you where are practical examples that you see this at play in water? Yeah, the meniscus is definitely one. Um, so the idea is that you've got glass, you've got water, and the water literally adheres to the glass because the glass is polar as well, and that pulls the meniscus up the sides. Help me put that together. Something with a super... Oh, yeah, right? Yeah, well, sort of. So, again, as Claire brought up, the idea that the major predictor of viscosity is size. Um, but that's an interesting thought. So, viscosity is dependent upon size, but adhesive forces is dependent on polarity. And so water has a really high meniscus because it's very, very polar. So how would that tie together? So if you've got a substance with a lower polarity and therefore weaker intermolecular forces, it would then have a smaller meniscus um, because it wouldn't be as attracted to the glass. The, the other extreme of that is actually mercury. Mercury's uh, meniscus is upside down. What yeah. Do What's that? Where do you measure it from? What do you mean? Oh, I see. So like with water, you measure from the bottom of the meniscus. What do you do with mercury? Uh, you just don't mess with it. Um, I, I don't know if there's necessarily a rule, but the interesting question to me is why? Why would, why would mercury have an inverted meniscus? And that actually leads us, sorry, this is going to freak out, but it leads us to our next um, point, which is cohesive forces. So cohesive forces, uh, well, I think you know, but cohesive forces are, are intermolecular forces that bind molecules to each other. And so guys, the, the example that we talk about most with this is surface tension. And this is where these ideas come together. We'll let people catch up and then we'll talk. But this is all about um, surface tension. You guys okay? Maybe I should ask. Never mind. We're going to do it anyway. I'm going to push you a little bit. You guys good? Not yet? What's that? <laughs> this is funny. 
You guys okay? So, guys, let's talk about this because this is weird. Um, this is mercury, but guys, mercury is a metal. And when we think about metals, we think about metallic bonding, right? Uh huh. So, guys, when we think about metallic bonding, what do we picture? What is the mental model we have in metallic bonding? The sea of electrons. And so we've got these positive nuclei in the sea of electrons. It creates the crystal structures that create solids. Guys, it's sea of electrons here as well. But now it's a sea of electrons that is weak enough that it doesn't stay together as a solid. It's a liquid. So now we can talk about this. So in here, we've got this sea of electrons, right, that, that keeps the substance together, at least as a liquid, not a gas. But then the idea is what would the intermolecular forces be between the liquid metal and the polar glass molecules? Strangely, there isn't one. There are no intermolecular forces that exist here. Maybe these might have a little bit of induced dipoles if it's sloshing a little bit. But fundamentally, these don't have intermolecular forces. They have this sea of electrons phenomenon, which is not attracted to the polar molecules in the glass. As a result, we've got these cohesive forces in the mercury, which are the sea that's really liquid metallic bonding and it makes these inward, well, these. It makes these attractive forces stronger than the attractive forces between the liquid and the glass. And so it actually puddles together, literally, and it forms an inverted meniscus. Isn't that weird? Did that make sense, y'all? Yeah. Let's talk about it. So let's do this. You guys, by this point in the year, are very, very comfortable with how bad an artist I am. But guys, let's again, we already talked about how to change your oil. Let's get really practical. Um, so this, of course, is your car. Yes? All right. I'm doing my best. And so guys, it starts raining on your car. And so I know now we go to Quick Quack to get our cars washed, but there was a day where you actually washed and waxed your car by yourself. I know, but you will notice if you go to Walmart, there is still a complete aisle that's dedicated to washing and waxing your cars. Go find it. So here's, and so, but Claire, to your question. So on, on the hood of your car, we've got paint. And that paint is, is very polar. Um, we know that because it all sticks together and it forms a hard surface, right? So when water falls on your paint, the polar water molecules are attracted to the polar paint molecules and the hood of your car just gets wet. It gets uniformly wet. So what do we do about that? Well, ready? I know you've never done this, but some of you pay for the upgraded quick quack wash and it actually puts a wax on your car. I know, this is getting crazy. Oh, it's true. And so guys, then the idea becomes this. When you wax your car, you are actually putting a coating of another molecular substance on top of the paint. Now guys, let me tell you this. The molecules inside of wax are huge and wildly symmetrical. Therefore, are they polar? Guys, you gotta be able to do this. So I just told you that wax molecules are huge and symmetrical. Are they polar? They are no easy. They are not polar, therefore do they exhibit dipole dipole forces? No. So what are the intermolecular forces that hold them together? Induce dipoles. But guys, these molecules, these are things you should know. These molecules are so huge and they are so polarizable that they're a solid at room temperature. 
But now here's the idea. The water molecules, it's not going to let me go. It's going to freak out. Guys, the water molecules then fall on your newly waxed car. What do the water drops do? Not first. They beat up. Guys, why do they beat up? Whereas on an unwaxed car, they spread out. Talk to the person next to you. Why do they beat up? Take a couple more seconds, you guys. So let's talk. But in order to have this conversation, let's do this first. Imagine that you didn't wax the trunk of your car. So unwaxed, we know it does this. What are the forces that cause the water to spread out across the paint? They are adhesive forces. Guys, let's go ahead and take the deeper plunge because this is where it gets hard. What are those intermolecular forces between the water and the paint? What kind of forces are they? Dipole, dipole, right? So dipole, dipole forces are at work causing adhesion between the water and the paint. Yeah? So what about over here? When we put the water on the waxed end of the car, what are the forces at work? What are the adhesive forces that are at work between the water and the paint? Fundamentally, there aren't any. Because, guys, what are the, what are the intermolecular forces that the wax can exhibit? Only induced dipoles. And, guys, here we've got dipole or even hydrogen bonding if we've got the right partner. But, guys, polar molecules are not attracted to induced dipoles. There's nothing to grab a hold of. There is no dipole that would be attractive in the wax. So if the wax is not attract, if the water is not attracted to the wax, what's it attracted to? The other water molecules. And that causes the water to beat up and roll off. Does that make sense? So then, guys, this. Why, why is the uh, meniscus and mercury upside down? Go ahead. So, good point. And so, guys, this is the thing that you're going to have to get used to. And again, this is hard. That's why we're starting this now. You need to be able to think in terms of relative strengths. So, guys, let's do this. What are the forces of attraction that exist between the water and the glass? Don't you, no, 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 no. Not, not adhesion, cohesion. What are the forces? Dipole, dipole. What are the forces that exist between the water and the water? Hydrogen forces. But, guys, what we end up happening here is these water mole or the glass molecules, we'll look more at their shapes and structures later, are actually pretty darn polar. They don't form hydrogen forces. We don't have the right situation for hydrogen forces, but these are polar enough that the dipole dipole forces pull the water up the size of the glass. There's a limit to it because the hydrogen forces are strong as well, but we do have strong dipole dipole forces. Again, and we call that adhesion that pulls it up the side. Go ahead. Jared, were you going somewhere? No? Okay. So now, guys, what about here? What are the intermolecular forces between the mercury and the glass? There really aren't any. What are the forces between the mercury and the mercury? Well, it's really kind of like metallic bonding. And that's stronger, and that creates cohesive forces that are stronger than the adhesive forces, and that causes it to form drops. If you think about it, this is really just kind of a drop reaching the surface in the same way we end up with drops forming between water and wax because the, wa the water is not attracted to the wax. Yeah.
Okay. Well, so titanium is a solid at room temperature. Um, if it were to melt, my suspicion is that its, its meniscus would be inverted as well. Okay. Um, but you also mentioned O2, and O2 is a gas. Yeah. So really, I mean, the place where we talk about meniscus is the interface between a liquid and a solid container, yeah. typically glass. Diatomic. diatomic, right? Yeah. But the diatomics, with the exception of bromine and iodine, are liquid or gases. Yeah. Um, but bromine's a liquid, so its um, meniscus should also be inverted. Oh. We here. What were the things we were going to look up? Um, amalgams, amalgams, and also bromine meniscus. That would be interesting to look up. Okay, are we good there, y'all? All right, guys, this is the one that we've got to give the most time to. This one is tricky. Vapor pressure. <clears throat> Grab your books. This one's tricky. So guys, what's the very first thing that we do when we have to learn something difficult? Not Babs. Draw a beaker. Then guys, put a lid on your beaker. Then put a liquid in the bottom of your beaker. I mean, a couple inches. It's not going to get real detailed. All right, so guys, then the idea is this. Put some molecules down here. You know what you could do is you could take the one you already drew and just draw a beaker around it. Oh. Know what I'm saying? Yes. Totally up to you. All right. So guys, here we have a liquid sitting in this beaker. Now guys, I know we've already drawn a lid on this, so don't change yours, but let's change mine. So imagine that we don't have a lid on this beaker. And if there's no lid on this beaker, as these molecules evaporate, where do they go? Away. Away. But now guys, let's put our lid back on our beaker. And now that we have our lid back on our beaker, we've now got some molecules that are up here in the vapor phase, but they can't go away. So some of them stay up in the vapor phase, and where do the rest of them go? Back into the liquid. So guys, just randomly, they're moving chaotically, entropy. Some of them are going to run back into the liquid, and when they do, they stick. What's eventually going to happen in this system? And what do we call constant? Equilibrium. So eventually this is going to reach equilibrium and we are going to have as many molecules leaving to the gas phase as we have condensing returning to the liquid phase. Does that make sense? You okay? Now guys, we are talking about vapor pressure. Here is our vapor. But what, and we haven't talked about gases yet, so this is new information to you. Guys, what is your mental picture of what those gas molecules are doing? They're moving all over, right? And every now and then, they run into the walls of the container. And when they run into the walls of the container, they push. What does that create? Pressure. Now, Here's the thing that makes this weird. When we talk about vapor pressure, we are actually talking about the vapor pressure of the liquid 
So we would say liquid water has this vapor pressure. So we assign the concept to the liquid, but what we're really talking about is the amount of gas that is trapped above the liquid. So now, guys, here's the question. What could we do to make the vapor pressure go up? without changing the size of the container. And actually, squishing the container wouldn't change it. Yeah, because what would happen, and we'll, we'll talk more about this. Again, this is why this is all hard, right? If we were to change the size of the container, it would simply drive more of the water molecules back into the liquid phase, and they'd reach the same equilibrium. Yeah, wait until you see those questions on the test, right? So not changing the size of the container. What could we do? Go ahead. Heat it. Guys, grab your books. I'm going to reach over your shoulder. Grab your books. And guys, we're going to go clear to the end. Clear to the end of the book. You're all right. Share with Jared. So guys, clear at the end. Clear. I'm trying to get you a page number. Um, clear at the end of the book. Here we go. Getting closer. Where are our appendices? Are they after the answers? Oh, here we go. All right, we're getting closer. Quadratic equation. Aha! Page 1058. So guys, looking at page 1058, we have support for what Jared just said. As the temperature goes up, what happens to the vapor pressure? Goes up. Now, guys, stop looking at your book and look at me. Have we talked about standard pressure? Haven't we done barometric pressure? Didn't you install barometers on your phones? Yeah. OK. Do you remember standard barometric pressure in TOR? 760. Now look at your book again. Do you get it? At what temperature does the vapor pressure become 760? 100 degrees Celsius. Guys, that is actually the definition of boiling point. Boiling point is the temperature at which a liquid has the same vapor pressure as the pressure of the atmosphere. So you ready for this? Guys, you can actually take water and you can figure out atmospheric pressure by boiling it. So water here, what does it boil at? About 96. So if you find 96, we now know the atmospheric pressure. 657.6. Get it? OK. Now, guys, this, joining me back at the board. What can we do to make the vapor pressure go down? Yeah, cool it down. But what else can we do to make the vapor pressure go down? No, so removing liquid wouldn't work. I said remove the lid. Oh, the li yes. But guys, without changing the, the, what else could we do? Guys, it's the lab that you're writing up right now. Go ahead. Add, add salt. Guys, if you add salt to this system, now we have salt molecules, salt ions, that are pulling on the water molecules. Watch what that changes. Imagine that this water molecule right here wants to jump out. Why can't it? There's a salt particle in the way. But imagine that this water molecule right here gets, clo gets close to the surface. What's going to happen? That ion is going to grab it. Guys, this is why colligative properties work. 
adding salt to the water makes it harder for the water to get out. It also makes it more likely that the water molecules that are out will get captured. And as a result, the boiling point has to go up. Why? Because it's harder to get this liquid to have the same vapor pressure as atmospheric pressure. So we have to heat it more to get it to boil. Are you starting to get a sense of why this unit is so crazy? Because there's lots of stuff to keep track of. Questions on vapor pressure? You okay? So vapor pressure, um, yeah, here, let me give it to you. Um, and it's simply this. So vapor pressure is the pressure of a gas that is supported over a liquid. And guys, maybe this is obvious, but it is inversely related to intermolecular forces. So I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we're going to take a break and come back for lab. So that second sentence, you could simply write like this. Higher IMFs, lower vapor pressure. They're inversely related. We okay? So guys, which one has a higher vapor pressure? Water or ethanol, alcohol? Which one has a higher vapor pressure? Talk to the person next to you. We'll talk for a minute and then we'll answer it and then we'll go. Ethanol or water? Which one? Hold on. Oh. Quietly so others don't hurry you. So guys, in order, and you will see questions like this on the AP test. These questions are always followed with explain. And so guys, you have got to take this all the way back to structure. So water, like this, ethanol, Like so. So guys, what are the intermolecular forces that hold the water together? Hydrogen forces. What are the forces that hold the ethanol together? Also hydrogen forces. But which one has stronger intermolecular forces, the water or the ethanol? Why the water? We haven't talked about this. Why the water? They both have hydrogen forces. Why would waters be stronger? That's part of it. You're halfway there. One of the reasons is because here we have two hydrogen atoms, two naked protons, and two unbonded pairs of electrons. Here we have two unbonded pairs of electrons, but only one naked proton. That's half of it. Go. Go. Well, but remember, this is, John, that, that's a really interesting point. And I want to talk about why it doesn't matter. Um, the idea is that it's the, this is our naked proton, and this is our naked proton. These hydrogens here do not get involved in hydrogen bonding because they're not naked because carbon's not strong enough. Go ahead. Good, yeah. So, so not only do we have two naked protons, we also have more unbonded electrons. But guys, you're still not there. There's another reason. Would it be because that the like, electronegativity arrows are the same question? Yeah, we lied to you last year and said that was true in general chemistry. Yeah, we talked about, but that's not the answer. Guys, you've never heard this from me before. Go ahead. Smaller. Water is smaller, and therefore they can get closer together. OK? 
Okay, so again, the question we're answering is which one has, do we say higher or lower, higher vapor pressure? Okay, so we've got to link it back to intermolecular forces. And guys, all you, you don't need, unless they really say talk about the intermolecular forces at play, you can simply say the intermolecular forces in water are higher. Therefore, what is true of the vapor pressure of water and, 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 and ethanol? Because which one will therefore have the higher vapor pressure? The ethanol, because its intermolecular forces are weaker and it, it vaporizes more readily. Is that okay? You gotta be able to tie intermolecular forces to vapor pressure. Is that good? Okay, so guys, we do have one more thing to do, but we're not going to. Um, it's actually pretty darn short. Um, we're gonna let it. We're gonna let it be. Um, it's all about solids. It's really interesting, but I know for our first day back, um, this has been a lot. Um, and so, guys, we are going to stop there. Um, I am going to show you the homework in all of this, and we are going to review this. Um, next time. So guys, this is the homework. Hold on. So guys, you've been working with me and Miss Call for 18 months. And one of the things that you have to agree with is me or me and Miss Call have never given you busy work. So, guys, the idea is this. We talked about the idea that, that third quarter is going to feel different. Um, still fun, still interesting, but this gets harder. And this also gets broader. Because I need to provide you more experiences because there's simply more stuff you need to know. But I promise you this. I will never give you huge homework assignments if they don't have a purpose. So guys, at this point, you've just got to trust me. These are the things that you need to look at in order to be sufficiently familiar with this material. You're going to find that there are some of them you can't do because we haven't talked about solids yet. So when you get to those questions, stop. But we are going to review these questions. Um, and we're going to count them as a homework assignment on Thursday. And the nice thing is, is when you do well on this assignment, it'll also raise your fourth quarter's grade. Take a break. We'll see you back in a few minutes.